and good. So the next one, this is uh, actually by far the largest section, um, the development environment. Lots and lots of changes here. Um, so yeah, as you can see, we might, we might have made one or two changes to the development environment there. Um, I hope you'll forgive me if I don't read them all out for you. Um, we'll just tackle them one by one. Um, I'm also going to kind of rattle through these pretty quickly, but again, you know, please do feel free, feel free to yell at me um, if you want me to you know, go over anything again or um, if you've got any questions. So let's get started with this one. Uh, first of all, layout customization. Uh, this is a pretty cool one to get started with. Um, so you can now customize the layout of hierarchy browser windows. So you can float panels, you can move panels, you can customize it however you like, um, and you can also save the layouts once you're happy with them. Um, so you can have you know, a nice little list of all of your saved layouts and um, you know, have things actually looking how you want it. So what does this look like? First of all, we'll start with the default layout. So that's probably what you're fairly, fairly used to. It's mostly the same as it was in 2016. A little bit of change, which I'll get into later. Mostly the same as 2016. But you might want it to look completely different. So let's say that you actually want the hierarchy to be much more prominent and take up the whole of the left side. You can do that. Um, you might want to move the method source window to the top right. You can do that. You can you know, move these however you like within this. You could also, maybe you want the method source to be really big and up there and you want to have this be on the right. However you want to lay it out, you can. Also, you can float windows. So this might be really useful if you're trying to, um, you know, maybe you've got multiple monitors, so you might want to have um, you know, your uh, hierarchy and your um, attributes and methods in one screen and then maybe your method source being all of the other screen. <coughs> However you want to float them. So, how, how do we do this is, of course, the question. Um, so, it's actually pretty simple to do this. All you have to do is, when you mouse over the left edge of a panel in the hierarchy browser, your cursor is going to now become a hand icon. Once you've got that hand icon, you can just drag the panel wherever you want. If you drag it within the hierarchy browser uh, window, then it's going to rearrange the panels for you. Um, and if you drag it outside the window, um, or if you hold control and then drag it, then it's going to float that panel for you. Um, you can float some or all of the panels, you can rearrange them in any configuration you like, change the sizes. Um, now once, once you've done that, once you've uh, sorted out the layout to what you want, you're probably going to want to save it, you don't want to have to go back and change it every time you load up your IDE. Um, so we've also got a um, menu in the view menu uh, called layout. So you go in the, the view menu, there's a layout sub menu. It's got a whole bunch of new useful information. Uh, sorry, a whole bunch of new options for you. Um, you can save as default layout, which will make that layout your layout for all of your hierarchy browser windows. There's also a save as default layout for schema, which will only save that layout when you're doing a hierarchy browser for that particular schema. If you go to a different schema, you can have a different layout. Um, the other thing that you can do there is if you've rearranged all of your panels and go, oh, actually, you know, I don't like this at all. You know, that was a terrible idea. Why did I lay it up like that? Oh, I want to go back to the default. Um, one of the layouts that will always be there is the default layout. You can just uh, go view layout, apply layout, default layout, and you'll go back to normal. What, um, what, why would you want a layout? specific to schema? Um, that's a good question. Essentially, um, you might have um, you might have one schema where you've got like a really complex hierarchy and most of the time, most of your work is going through the hierarchy and making sure that you've got the um, the right method. So it's like when I'm dealing with that schema, I'd actually really like my hierarchy to be really prominent. Um, and then you might have another one where actually it's a pretty small schema, so I'd really like my method um, source to be really large. Um, personally, I always just have the same layout for every schema, um, but if you did want to have one for different, you know, essentially it's a matter of it, it was as easy to make it on a per schema basis as it was to, um, 
have it just be the same for every schema. So if you want to use that feature, you can. If you want it to be for every schema, then you can do that as well. So does that mean that you've got schema specifics in your user preferences? Um, so this is, it, it's not, um, the, the normal user preferences won't have schema specific things. It's just this layout feature, which is kind of, while it's a user preference, it's not from the user preference dialog. Um, so this is kind of, in that way, a separate feature, and will be on a either whole um, whole system basis or on a per schema basis. Y you can't, for instance, go and uh, you know change your uh, font size for one particular schema in the user preference. Is that what you were yes, asking? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Put another way: is the default way of layout saved in part of preferences? So if I export preferences and then download that into another environment, would I take it? Um, no, this is a, essentially, a, it doesn't count as user preferences, it's a, a separate concept. So um, it, won't, it, won't, it won't load with all of the normal user preferences things. That's Okay. I assume if you've got um, one of those panels undot or floating, yep. close the main one, they'll Correct, them. yes. When you reopen, do they default back to docked? No, they default back to however you had it. As you left it? Yes. Yep. You got the yeah. Save yeah. yeah. Cool. Any um, more before we go along? No? Cool. So, um, I mentioned, I mentioned before that the default hierarchy browser was mostly the same um, as in 2016. There is a little bit of difference, and this is part of one of the things we're trying to do around interfaces, is I'm sure many of you are aware we've had interfaces in the product for some time, uh, but what we're just trying to do is just make them a little, more, little bit more prominent and easy to use. Um, so one thing that we've done is we've got this new tab in your methods list called interface. Um, on this, it will show for the currently selected class um, all of the methods that are fulfilling an interface. So, for instance, in this particular one, um, this class uh, implements iDebuggable and iSearchable, and there's one method each for those two interfaces, um, just as an example. Uh, so you can, if you're quickly seeing, okay, what, what of my methods are part of interfaces, you can just pop over to that interface tab and have that information right there for you. Um, in addition, with regards to interfaces, again, very really small little change here, is the interface browser now joins the having an icon in the main toolbar club. Uh, so previously you just had the class browser, primitives browser, maps browser, applications browser, and schema browser. Well, now the interfaces browser is on there as well just in case you're one of those people who really likes clicking on buttons rather than using keyboard shortcuts. But more importantly, just to make it a little bit more visible. Um, so maybe someone using Jade for the first time would be able to actually see, oh, I wonder what this button does. Oh, I see, it's, we've got some interfaces to use. Um, now, next along, this is a um, opt-in, another one of these opt-in ones, so it's gonna be off by default. Um, you can now opt into extra navigation bar on the hierarchy browser. Uh, what, this, what that means is in your hierarchy browser, at the top, you're going to have three combo boxes. One for all of your schemas, one for all of the classes within the currently selected schema, and then one for all of the methods within the currently selected class. Um, so the idea is this is just going to make it easier to find um, schemas, classes, or methods if you have a lot of them. Um, to turn it on, we've got this, um, pardon me, sorry, got a new button in the user preferences um, in the browser, um, browser sheet. And check that one, and it's going to pop up the new navigation bar. What that's going to look like, you see that you've got the old version here, new version here. You just see there's three extra new combo boxes here. Now, one thing that um, makes this kind of a little bit easier to use is when you click and you scrolling down, it's not just going to, um, you don't have to scroll through all of, all of your classes or all of your schemas, because there might be a lot of those. Um, you can actually type into it, and it's going to filter down your list to anything that matches that, and then you can 
click and select what you want. So if you did have you know, 100 classes or something, you probably don't want to scroll through all of them. You'd much rather type in the first little bit, and then you can you know, click on what you're after. Um, this is essentially trying to solve one of the, the issues if when you start getting really complex hierarchies here, it can often be pretty hard to find what you're looking for. There's just one more way of making it a little bit easier to find what you're after. Um, cool, so next one along, we've made a couple of little improvements to the applications browser. Um, both of these pretty, pretty minor things and really just visual things to make it just a little bit easier to use and a little bit nicer. So we've got the ability to sort now and we've also got a little bit of extra information coming your way. So for sorting, this is really just as simple as you can now um, sort your application browser um, by any of the columns. So if you click on any of these column headers, whoop, sorry my uh, hand isn't very steady here, click on any of these and it's going to sort by that column. So in this case I've sorted by name, um, that one's alphabetically, that one's reverse alphabetically. So you click it once, alphabetically, click it again, reverse alphabetically. Um, you can do that for any of these column headers. It um, can just make it a little bit easier to find what you're looking for if you have a lot of applications. Um, next one along, now this is for one specific case. So the case we're looking at is you have an application that you haven't specified any particular initialization or finalize. Oh, sorry. Do I have a hand up? Oh, no, no that's cool. Sorry. Um, okay, so you've got an application. You haven't set any particular initialization or finalize method. The method called initialize or the method called finalize is going to be called by default. That's kind of always been the case. Now, if you've got that situation and you've also re implemented initialize, um, what we're going to start doing is actually putting a little thing in here saying that, hey, initialize is being called by default. Now, we're only going to do that if you've actually re-implemented it, um, simply because there is that kind of case where, hey, you've re-implemented initialize and it's doing all, sort of th all sorts of things. You might not have actually intended that you were calling this by default. So just to kind of let you know, um, we've got this new message here that lets you know that it's called by default if it's... Uh, just in case people don't realise, if you don't click on those uh, methods, you will actually open a, a source mm. browser, for, uh, sorry, a source window for that method. Mm. Do you mention, by the way, the form and control event tabs in the uh, in the methods list? Have you got that later, or is that uh, is that been missed? The form and control tabs, and what you know, how you have the interface tab? Yep. There is also two new tabs, one for form events and one for control events. Oh, and the, yeah, when you're looking at a yes. window. I didn't actually have that anywhere in the presentation. Okay. So you might have to show that. So. Yep. Cool. Sweet. Now, next along, we have autocomplete enhancements. So autocomplete's here, typing away, it's going to suggest useful things that you might like to type next. Um, so it's a useful tool for determining uh, what sort of parameters you might need to pass to a method, among other things. Um, in J2018, we have enhanced this just a little bit. Uh, so it now works a little bit better for specifically the get at key method um, of dictionaries. Um, so the tricky thing with using dictionary.get at key is you don't necessarily know what sort of key you're supposed to be putting in. So if you look at uh, kind of how it used to use, uh, it used to look, you do this dictionary.get at key, and it will go, hey, you need to put a key in here. Um, it's going to be some sort of key, and it's going to be some sort of key type. Um, tell you that you need to put it in, but it wouldn't tell you what. So really, it would be really nice if it could actually just let you know, well, what, what sort of key am I supposed to be putting in here? As of 2018, it now does. So in this particular case, my customer dictionary is a dictionary of customers, and the key is the customer's name. You'll see that as soon as I type in dict.get a key, it's going to pop up this little thing going, hey, you need to put in a name, and that name's of type string. Um, next thing with get a key is um, probably all very familiar with the, the square bracket syntax for dictionaries, the kind of like index lookup. That's actually exactly the same as a get at key uh, method call. Um, that's 
really it's just syntactical sugar, you can save yourself a bit of typing. Now previously, if you were using that, um, the autocomplete wouldn't actually tell you anything. Um, now, not only does it tell you, hey, by the way, what you're doing here is actually a little bit of a shortcut for get a key, so that's what, really what you're doing, um, but it'll also tell you what key you're supposed to be putting in now. Um, so that can just be useful, especially if you've got a lot of dictionaries and maybe not sure what key you're supposed to put in. Um, it'll let you know as you go. Is that for the other key method as well? Um, so the question was, does it work for like get a key less than equal to, greater than equal to? No, just for the get a key for now. Um, Sounds like a Jedi. <laughs> Sorry, I might, I might be wrong. I can't remember. Well, actually, let's, let's find out, actually. There was just anywhere where key type appears. Okay, just anywhere where key type appears. I'm going to, rather than actually just trying to guess, let's actually bring this up and have a little bit of a look. Um, oh, where's my mouse? Yeah, hopefully I should have one in my TOI schema. Um, doo -doo -doo. So I think this is where I put my dict, custom dict. Good, I do have one here. So if I go dict.get at key greater, let's see what happens. Ah, good, it does work. Fantastic. Yeah. Make sure they work on, um, I mean, if it works on that one, I'm pretty sure it'll work on all of them. Yes, good, good, good. I hadn't actually checked that one, so thanks for that. That's a really good question. Nice. Also, yeah, it's much better to actually just look and have a look in the demo um, rather than me guessing. What's that? Oh, yeah, yeah. We, we, try and, uh, we try and keep things fast. Of course, the really impressive thing would have been if it didn't work and then I'd just, you know, okay, let me just, you know, I'll just change in the sort, right? Okay, yeah, we got a new build. I'm not quite that fast. Right. Um, so with that, so I'm just going to have to dum da dum da dum. Make sure we're at the right place. Good. So next thing, now this is um, this one. I didn't actually know about this feature until I was prepping for this TOI. Um, but in the bottom right of the J development environment, we've got this the name of the currently selected schema and then the um, the default application, right? I didn't actually know what that was there, to be honest. But yeah, no, yeah, you got some information there. Now, the, the new feature regarding that is you can now click on it and change the default application from here, just in case you really hated the application browser. Um, so, you've got your default application here. You click on it, magically turns into a combo box. You can click on that combo box, select the application you want, and change it. It's not like you couldn't do that with an application browser, but, you know, you might want to just do it from there, and now you can. One more thing to click on. What's that? Yeah. Um, let's go quick. Like, how would you do that? Because like, maybe have like a little little play button right next to it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We have a run button. Because we've got a run button up the top, and you can right click on that, and it plays the default application. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Moving that. <laughs> Alrighty. Cool. I can just imagine now that we've got a fully functioning application browser in that little bottom right. But anyway, unless any more questions, I'll move on to Maps Browser. Right, so for the Maps Browser, essentially all we're doing here is we're just um, making things presented just a little bit more nicely for you. Um, so it's nothing that you're going to have to actually do, it's just when you look at your Maps Browser, it's going to be a little bit nicer. Um, so first of all, all your class names then are sorted alphabetically. To be honest, I'm not actually sure what they used to be sorted by, um, or if they were sorted at all, but they're now sorted alphabetically. Second of all, um, all your classes, they're now going to have this prefix of what schema they come from. It's going to be particularly useful if you've got the same class name in multiple schemas in a map file for some reason. Um, so, yeah, you're going to have all your schema and then your class name. Um, and also it's alphabetically. And that's really all there is to say about that. Nothing we really need to do with it, just you get more information. Now... Does 
that alphabetically by class name yeah. or alphabetically by scheme within class name? Um, by class name, I believe. Yeah, they're all from model, aren't they? But yeah, it's, it's by, well, according to the documentation, it's by class name, yeah. Um, so it would be class name, then by schema name, I believe. Hopefully that's right. No. no. So. Was it by schema, then class? I think it's schema, class. It makes sense by schema, then class. Okay, cool. Cheers, Bob. <laughs> yeah, so schema, then class. My apologies. Right. Uh, next one along. We have cleaning up unused variables. Um, so one of the things we're trying to do is just make the refactoring process a little bit easier. Um, so there's, we've got a few features around this, but this is the, the kind of, oh, it's the cooler one, so it gets its own feature. Um, so we had previously a dialog um, the find unused variables. Um, so you could, you know, have a method, you could, uh, uh, yeah, right click on the method, go find unused variables, it would tell you whatever variables you have declared but never actually used in the code. Uh, we've made that a bit better, so rather than just finding them, you can also now remove them from that dialog. Um, so previously it just used to say, you know, find next, yes, no, and it would highlight the current one it's up to, but it would be up to you to go and delete them. Um, we can save you a bit of time and work with that, because the find unused variables um, dialog now has extra options so that you can remove as you go. So find next and cancel are just the same thing as yes and no previously, um, but we'll see that the uh, tells you which variable you're up to as well, as well as highlighting it in the method source. And we've got two extra new buttons, remove, remove all. So remove um, is just going to remove the currently selected um, unused variable that you're up to. So if you want to go through one by one and you know remove, remove, remove and see what you're doing as you go, um, you can also at any point just click remove all and it'll just go through and remove all of the unused variables from that method. Um, now, just in case, um, when you are cleaning up an unused variable, you do get a chance to confirm. Um, so it's not going to automatically and save, save the method or compile it or anything. Um, after it's removed those unused variables. So you might, for instance, go remove all and then go, oh, actually, whoops, one of the, one of the unused variables that I, was, that I was looking at, I did actually intend to use that later. Maybe I didn't want to press that button. Um, so it won't automatically save and compile. It's up to you to, assuming you're happy, save and compile it. Um, if you're not happy, you can just navigate away and abandon the changes. Um, but Using the new feature, you can remove all of the variables one by one and check as you go, or you can just hit remove all, get rid of all of them. Question on that. Hmm? Will it detect a variable that is only deleted? Like if you have a it, big log delete, class it created as a transient, will it detect that the only use of this is this delete statement? Um, it will, so it, it will, um, it will detect, no? So it will count that as unused or not? It won't count as unused, right? Yeah, good. Cool, that's what I thought. Yeah. <laughs> so, if you, so if you have an un... So you're not using the variable at all, but you are deleting it. Uh, yeah. Because that still like it counts as a use. It's not a meaningful use. Um, essentially, what it's going to do is it's going to scan through your method and go, "Have you used this anywhere?" That would count as a use. It's a pretty pointless use, but it's use. Um, yeah. So. Cool. Um, next along, um, information on controls. Just a pretty minor simple thing here. If you're looking at a control in the class hierarchy browser. Um, you've got any design time properties. So previously you might have had to pop over to the painter a bit um, to just check, you know, what was the caption on this label or, you know, whereabouts on the, on the form was it positioned? Um, was it enabled or not? This is at design time. Obviously if you modify something at runtime, the class hierarchy browser can't really know about that. Um, but if you're looking for design time uh, information, you can actually just, when you've got the control selected, you can see that information straight from there. Is that all 
Um, so, it, the, so the question is, if you have added, you've got a custom control and you've added a property to it, will it be shown, or is it just the root schema um, properties? It, it's only going to show the those values. Um, mm. it's, just, it's just a mm. few selected common mm. products. Mm. Just the same. Cool. Not every property. Yeah. Cool. Um, now, a couple of things just with the editor. Um, first of all, you can now zoom in and out with control mouse wheel um, and control middle mouse wheel to uh, restore default size. Um, you may be familiar with also the control plus and control minus keyboard shortcuts to increase or decrease the font size of a um, editor window. You can now do that with a mouse as well, just control mouse wheel. Um, exactly the same functionality, just different keyboard shortcut, or mouse shortcut I should say. Um, the next thing is we've got a couple of uh, features around here. Rectangular selection, I'll show you what that looks like. Um, and also finding all instances of an identifier. So, rectangular selection, essentially that's the normally how you select something. If you want to make one of these square or rectangular selections, um, you just hold the Alt key while selecting. You can know, hold, Alt, click and drag, um, and it'll do a rectangular selection rather than the normal one. Um, I don't know how many uses there are for that. One could be if you've got a whole bunch of prefixes, you could Alt and drag and, yeah. <laughs> Bob shaking his head, head yep. Um, cool. So then, I mean, that's just one that, you know, we kind of got us a bit of a freebie. It's kind of cool. Really? Oh, interesting. So I, should, I didn't actually check that it wasn't in 2016, but it was in the documentation notes of, as a new feature. So that's okay. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Well, my. Welcome to the 2016 TOI, where we're going to tell you about features that have been in the product for a while. Yeah, no, I didn't actually bother checking that it wasn't already in the product, but uh, yeah, in the documentation notes, um, apparently there's this new feature. Because uh, we did an upgrade to, what was, what was the name of it, Scintilla? Oh, I don't have it in my notes anymore. Um, yeah, there was, a, um, there was an upgrade to Scintilla, I think it was 4.7.1 that we did, um, which is the open source editor that we use for our... Um, method editors, and that was listed one of the features. So yeah. Um, next along, editor improvement highlighting matches. Um, hopefully this is a new one at least. Um, if you have a um, identifier or even just a little bit of characters selected, um, it's just going to match you with all of the other uh, instances of that. Two versions, you can highlight only the whole word matches, so highlighting str won't match with string, or this other one where it does. To toggle between them, uh, there's just this checkbox here, only highlight whole word matching selection, and the editor options for the user preferences. Is there a way to turn it off completely? Um, no, you're always going to get the, um, if you've got something selected, highlighting the matches. Yeah. Like the, the, the yeah. to change, the, you can change the colour, the matching color. Yeah. Oh yeah, you can. If you really wanted to turn it off, yes, you're right. Because um, all of the colours are customisable, you could get rid of that in, in your preferences. But I don't know. I just find it a really useful feature. But yeah, cool. Um, now this. Actually, speaking of discos, um, <laughs> this is another one where um, you know. I'll, I'll leave it as an exercise for the reader to find a use case for it. Um, but you can actually, when, anytime you've got a methods list, so that can be like a methods view browser, whatever it is, you right click on a method, um, you pop into the highlight method item background um, submenu of the context menu, and it's got a whole bunch of different colours, and you can colour your methods that. I mean, I guess it could be useful if you've, you know, you're working on a whole bunch of methods and it's like, oh, I want to make sure I remember to come back to that one. You know, make it bright, bright red and it'll definitely stand out. Um, yeah, makes life just a little bit more like a disco, I guess. Um, yeah, so if you just right-click any of these methods, um, 
and the context menu that pops up, we've got a new entry, it's right down the bottom, highlight method item background. Um, in that sub menu, there's all the different colors you can make it. Does that go with user preferences across when you import export? Uh, it's only as long as that window's open. Ah. Yeah. So it's a very temporary thing, um, and it would just be for that specific method in that specific method list. Cool. Now, whizzing along, we've got some paint for improvements. I'll try and run through this pretty quickly. Um, first of all, hierarchy for form dialogue. That's the dialogue that shows you all your controls that parents or children of others. The new feature here is you can hold um, shift and you can drag, and you can drag child controls to different parents using this. When you do, it pops up this confirmation box. Um, Cancel means no, I don't want to change it after all. Yes or no determines whether you're going to change its position. Um, uh, so yes will um, pop it actually into that, um, into the location of the screen where the parent is. No will um, preserve the absolute screen position of the child control. Uh, next one, another really really minor one here. Um, if you've got a um, control that has been inherited from a like a super form, then obviously you're not allowed to change that at all. Um, so we're just going to colour all of the properties blue to let you know that hey, this is something that you've inherited, so you can't actually muck about with the control. Um, the other little minor change is um, for any sort of text properties like caption. Uh, it used to be completely disabled, now it's read-only, so that just means that you can copy from it if you like. Um, next along your um, properties window, um, so previously every time you closed a form, your properties window would also close. Um, now it's only when you close your last form. So if you have like 10 forms open, you close one of them, it's not going to close the properties window each time. Uh, next of all, selecting a number of controls. So this is just to do with, if you have a, um, say, a parent uh, control selected, you can now use this new select all children um, command. It will just select all of the children of that parent. Um, the other one is select all siblings, which again, if you've got a, a child control, then it's going to select all of the other children of the parent. Um, and for the, um, for the select all children, it's going to deselect the parent, but for the select all sibling, it's going to be this control and all of the other siblings. So how do you do that? Um, so there's two new commands, select all children, select all siblings. For the uh, keyboard shortcut for them, children is control shift C, siblings is control shift L, or you can do it from the controls menu if you like. Cool. Um, speaking of which, new keyboard shortcuts. This is pretty much as simple as we, it's kind of a bit of a work in progress getting everything to have a um, keyboard shortcut. In the painter, there's now lots more of them. Uh, I would say most of the, the painter commands now have shortcuts. Uh, not all, but we're, we're getting there. What's that? Select, select parent. Uh, there was, yeah, select parent, control shift P for that one. So I'm very used to holding control and selecting multiple that way. Mm. If I have selected some, and then I use control on one of the other options. Does it maintain what I've already selected as well? I just add the group? Uh, let's find out. Whee! Right, so if I add a control, let's say I'll have a frame. And then, let's say I've got some buttons. So are you saying like if I go this, control this, and then controls select all children? Oh, I didn't actually select control when I did that. Oh, I don't know if I can select control. Yeah, no. Um, if I go like this, this. Oh, if I go like this, control, should I talk children and then control this? Yeah, then I can do that. Um, I can do that. This, control, select all siblings. Yeah, so it's going to, for 
like this and because I can't really because control is one of the um, one of the parts of the shortcut as well so I can't really call control while I'm doing that uh, even if I click on it yeah so no you can't combo this command with the control to select many unless Bob has a solution to this no no nah. No, I was just going to uh, mention your slide, unfortunately. If you go to the controls menu. Oh, sorry. Um, and the painter? Yeah. Cool. Uh, well, that, that one would have done. The delete control, uh, there's a shortcut on your slide which we've had to take off because unfortunately it meant that when you use the delete key in editing anything in the properties dialog, it deleted the control, so. Oh, delete control for delete. So it was a bit of an uh, <laughs> oversight, unfortunately. Whoops. So <laughs> Alas. Alrighty. <laughs> cool. So, um, just a minor usability improvement, if you try and um, set a menu shortcut um, for something and you've already used that menu shortcut, it's now just going to validate that and let you know that you've already used it. Um, pretty much as simple as that. Uh, separators, um, some of you might be familiar with separators, we actually we took it out in 2016, which brought it back with a slightly different interface. Um, so now if you've got your control palette edit, you can just drag a, um, a separator onto the control palette. And that's just, it doesn't do anything, it just visually splits up your control palette a bit. Um, now, I mentioned that there was more refactoring improvements coming. Uh, just very small things along here that we'll try and whiz through pretty quickly. Um, first of all, declaring local variables. So this is something you've been able to do for a while. Um, if you, um, you know, this is kind of the opposite of an unused variable, something that you've used but you haven't actually declared yet. You've always been able to right click and um, go declare variable. We've got an improvement to it where it can actually guess the type for you in most cases. Um, so for instance, uh, if you've got unknown variable equals 4 minus 3, it's going to automatically figure out that that's an integer. Um, and so it's not going to bring up that dialog. Same thing if it's in a for loop, it can just deduce the type um, from, you know, strings is a string array, therefore unknown variable must be a string. Just going to save you a little bit of typing. Um, now for renaming, this is just another bit of validation. If you're renaming a variable and the variable name you choose has already been used, you're not going to get an error message uh, just to let you know, hey, you know, that's not something you can select and you can go back and select something else instead. Cool. Lastly, the good old the magic number hunt. If you've got a bit of a magic number you want to turn it into a constant, you actually just right click it, um, put in the name of your constant and it'll become a local constant. So that's the promote to method context, ah, sorry, promote to method constant feature uh, from the identifier context menu. Um, just note that if you've got multiple, like 0.15s in this case, it's only going to change the one you select because it doesn't necessarily know that the same number represents the same concept. Uh, now, search improvements. Um, just a couple of minor improvements for you. First of all, if you're using Control F and you've gone F3, F3, F3 to find again, you go, oh, actually I pressed F3 too many times, don't want to go back, Shift F3 will go backwards through your, your find results. So it's just a new little um, option there. And searching by uppercase initials, um, this is a you know, kind of a favourite of mine. If you're searching for something like Jade Web Service Soap Handler, that's a lot to type in to find what you're after. <laughs> You can now just search by initials, um, so you can just type in JWSSH and it'll find it. Wonderful. Um, the other thing you'll notice is in this one it had lots and lots and lots of things and it's just selected the one you're up to. This is uh, how it worked in 2016. Um, for 2018 it's actually going to filter the list as you go, just to make it a bit easier to find what you're after. Cool. Um, now. We've got a couple of extra changes to shortcut and function keys. Um, one of them is a little bit of a change of behavior when you're using control B for opening a class hierarchy browser. Um, and one of them is custom shortcut keys. So first of all, um, this is specifically in the case you have a class hierarchy browser open already. And with that selected, you go control B to open a new one. Um, what it's going to do is that new browser is going to have the same class selected as you had in your old one. 
Um, previously, it would always just select object. If you go and you actually click on that little picture of a C, um, then it doesn't count as coming from the hierarchy browser, so it will still have object. Uh, so this is just if you've already got a browser open and you're just using um, Control B to open a new one. Also, if you have an methods list, like you've done references, that will take you to the class that you've got selected. So mm. the, the method that, that it's on will take you to that class. Yes. Um, yeah. So let's. So, okay. So if you're um, what in a control shift? Oops. So if you do like references on your customer dictionary. Oh, that's not what you're looking for. How do I call it? Hi. Ah. Okay. So C cust dicts. Compile that, and now there'll be a reference. And then I go Control B, yep. and then yep. Cool. <coughs> now, next one along is so custom shortcut keys. Um, essentially, anything that's a keyboard shortcut, you can now customize to whatever keyboard shortcut you like. There's only a couple of limitations, uh, or first of all, I should say, actually, um, on the shortcut keys sheet. It's where we're looking. There's actually a new sheet. I think there was another one that was called something else before, but uh, Accelerate is still there. There was, I can't remember what it's called. Yeah, well, I'm anyway. We've got a new sheet here, shortcut keys. Um, it's got a list of all of the keyboard shortcuts for everything you could possibly want to do. Um, and you can just click on any of these and put in a new key combination and change the shortcut. Now, Basically, three, um, three exceptions. First of all, as you mentioned, accelerator keys. Uh, we do still have the accelerator key tab. If you're trying to change an accelerator, you can still do it. You just have to do it from that, that tab button and shortcut keys. Um, second one is there are some standard Windows shortcuts. They're not actually Jade. They're Windows. So that's stuff like your Control Z for undo, uh, Control C for copy. Um, you can't customize those. Um, the third kind of caveat is anything that doesn't already have a shortcut, you can't actually add one. This list is just going to have all of the um, all of the shortcuts that already exist, and then you can change them to a different key combo. Um, now, final <coughs> section of the um, J development environment, I think it is. So this is the show symbol feature, um, probably better known by its keyboard shortcut, or at least by me, F11. Um, so this is when you've got a method open and you're going F11 on a method within it to go through that method and so on and so forth through a chain of methods. So looking like something like this, you've got a method 1 that calls method 2 and method 2 calls method 3. If you just click on uh, M1, hit F11, it's going to open up M2. Go to M2, you click on M3, hit F11, it's going to open up that one pretty common thing to be doing. Um, previously, you just get a new window for each of them. Uh, we have the ability now to just put them all in the same source window and have a little hierarchy up the top here. Um, so if you want to take advantage of this, um, you're looking in the source management sheet and you've got uh, reuse same method source for all, um, or also same method source um, for each origin. Uh, the difference is, for all, you get one big um, method source window, no matter where you're coming from. Um, for each origin is, if you have one class hierarchy browser and you're doing this, you get one method source window. You then open up a new class hierarchy browser and do the F11, you'll get a separate uh, one. So it will be on a per hierarchy browser basis for the um, reuse same method source for each origin option. Um, so yeah, you don't have to use this feature, it is an opt-in. If you really do like there to be you know, 20 windows popping up as you dig through, then you can still do that. Um, but if you want to opt into this feature, it's just on the source management tab and then you get these nice little common windows here. <coughs> 